Hello, my name is Professor David Tizard. Welcome to Lecture 2, this exploration of the Korean wave. Last lesson, uh, we looked through some of the origins and uh, going through your assignments and, and your thoughts and your feedback. It was very interesting to see how surprised you were by some of the developments in the history of K-pop. It's really important that we, you know, before we start looking at the modern videos and what's happening today, that we understand where it has come from. I think that's really important that we chart a little bit of the history and some of the ideas. I don't want to do that for too long. I do want to get up to the modern age. So last time we were in 2007 era, we've come up to 2012. And in the world of K-pop or in the world of the Korean wave, Five years can be a very long time. So today we're looking at a piece uh, from 2012 by John Lee called What is the K in K-pop? It's a very important question, actually, because it looks at the cultural identity of what is Korean and, and what this thing going abroad is. Overall, I was very pleased with your work last week. Some really excellent pieces. Some other pieces we need to do a little bit work, more work with your academic uh, performance. But that's natural. That takes time. I'll explain more about that at the end of the video. Feel free to contact me if or when you have any questions. So for now, let's, let's make a start. Um, I'm going to go to this one. That makes sense. Yes. Today's article by John Lee. He does a lot of work on Korean culture and has a concept called cultural amnesia. We might come to that elsewhere. But we see here today, uh, he's asking this question. I need to get my things right. What is the K in K-pop? So perhaps before we explore that, I mean, is he simply talking about, is it Korean? Does it stand for something else? Where does it come from? And we're looking at this culture and national identity. Really important things here. Let's, let's start with the articles. We've got a lot to get through, so let's see what we have. The pheno phenomenal success of the Korean wave has generated collective celebration in South Korea. This is very interesting, I find personally. It's generated collective celebration. Okay, This idea that it's something for everybody to be proud of, a collective celebration. For example, if, um, you know, Ed Sheeran or Adele start getting global recognition and they're from the same country that I am, do I personally feel any pride or any sense of achievement for these people having done so well abroad? Perhaps not. There might be many different reasons for that. There might be the reason um, that historically or traditionally, at least in the in the latter half of the 20th century, uh, Britain had a successful music market. So for these things to succeed overseas or these artists wouldn't be that surprising. We've had since the Beatles broke America and things like that. Maybe it's because it's not surprising. Maybe there are other reasons. Maybe if you if you take a sort of Eurocentric view, which is, you know, or even an ethnocentric view, it might be considered something taken for granted that these artists would succeed abroad. And I personally would feel no uh, success or no sense of achievement for it. Another thing to look at would be to whether you have independent or collective cultures. Now, a lot of work has been done on this in sociology, whether some cultures are more independent, individ individualistic, and other countries, other cultures are more collectivist, more uh, interdependent with each other. And you see this in um, things like in the Korean language, where you have Uri, Uri Nara, more broadly in society, you have sort of Uri Dal, Uri Nampyeon, Uri Yunheng, all this concept of our. So what is produced by Korea has this sense of collective ownership, collective responsibility. If the nation does something great, there's a 
a collective sense of achievement and if the nation does something bad there's this collective sense of uh, disappointment or despair so we have to wonder is k-pop unique in that it has a collective sense to it and when k-pop does well it does produce this collective celebration you should really think about uh that word for me and how much that means to you as a korean or an international student looking at these things i'm going to move my keyboard over here so it's a bit easier for me in the early 2010s the national self-congratulation is especially manifest for the popularity of south korean popular music k-pop which has spread from neighboring asian countries such as japan and taiwan to further ashore in europe the americas and the middle east the k-pop world festival in december 2011 attracted wannabe k-pop singers from 16 different countries confirmed its global appeal to south koreans k-pop news generate media headlines the south korean government intent on enhancing its soft power along with its export prowess has actively promoted k-pop Many younger South Koreans are eager to embrace the global success of K-pop, which somehow proves the creativity and coolness of South Koreans hitherto known for producing cars and cell phones rather than engrossing dramas and popular songs. Diligence and intelligence rather than beauty and style. K-pop in particular and the Korean wave in general raise a wide range of questions, but I focus on two. What are the sources of K-pop's recent commercial success? What does it say about South Korean society and culture? From those, the, the second question I believe is, you know, really important that we're going to look at today. Last lesson, we noticed that K-pop started with the export, or the, the rise in popularity, the changing of Asian economies, having more disposable income so they could buy exports, technology changing things, also a little bit more of a pan-Asian feel but this you can see by the time we get to 2012 the k-pop articles now mentioned that uh the korean wave and these kind of things have gone further afield to europe and the americas which wasn't really the case in 2007 in the last one you see here we, we looked at the term of soft power that one from joseph uh, nye so make sure you have an understanding of that go and uh, check that out but that's where your culture can attract people to you as the opposite of hard power the young south koreans are eager to embrace the global success which proves the creativity and coolness so previously things stereotypes generalizations would have been that uh, northeast asian south koreans are diligent they are hard working and they're intelligent, they have great uh, mathematical ability, scientific prowess, uh, great intelligence and IQ. But what K-pop was changing in terms of the identity, especially for younger South Koreans, it helped them because we're always stuck in this uh, existential question of who am i or who are we and so with k-pop and the korean wave becoming successful more broadly around the world into europe into the americas it starts giving different answers to these questions it starts changing and there was a reshaping it's it's suggesting here by john lee of the Korean identity or, or, or the Korean view of itself and also the external view, so the internal view and the external view, that it was changing from diligent and intelligent to beauty and style. Things not normally associated with, in let's say, the international view, whether that's right or wrong, but that might have been a, a stereotype. These you might have associated with France, with Paris, with Madrid, with Rome, things like that. Not always necessarily with Seoul. But now K-pop was changing that. The Korean wave was changing that. It was changing the way people think about themselves. So this is where we get into the nature of culture and identity, which is something that this is looking at. 
So I hope you understand uh, the basic ideas in this introduction, how the Korean wave can change the country's identity or the people's perception of itself, especially as it starts spreading further and further afield. Any effort to make sense of culture is fraught with difficulties, because, beginning with the concept of culture. Do we mean the greatest achievements of the elite or the least common denominators of the people? The very idea of an integrated culture or a culturally unified people is also something of a dubious proposition in most places and times before the advent of the modern nature nation state. So as you go through this, you should start building up a definition of culture so for example you might find that in week one author a defined culture as this and author b in week two defined it as this in your own private research you found author c did this in a different language culture is defined by this it's really hard to nail down what culture is and there'll be many various definitions that you come across start building up your own idea of what this word is because you know it, it's Munua but what is what is that you know you can break it down into Hanja characters and things like that but trying to understand what culture is and this is a very important question is culture the greatest achievements of the elite or the least common denominators of the people here you have ideas of high culture and low culture this doesn't mean one is better than the other. It doesn't mean, you know, high is great and low culture is bad. Um, it, it's not intended to be like that. But high culture refers to some things that, that are not enjoyed by the majority of society, but say the, the economic upper class. Uh, you might have things like ballet, opera, uh, horse riding, these type of things. Right? which is not something that everybody does and it's not interesting to everybody but it'd be associated with a certain degree of sophistication and expense low culture on the other hand might mean pop music you know mainstream media and primetime tv again this is not to say that it's worse but it's enjoyed by a different part of the population so when we talk about culture are we talking about this one or this one of course there are other types you would also have a counterculture and you can have subculture we'll probably have to go into these at some point but counterculture is different and subculture is also different subcultures exist inside here so subcultures might be the the goths the, the sports people, the hippies, you know, they're subcultures, they're not mainstream, but they, they still exist inside the main culture. The countercultures exist outside and they wish to break the paradigm. So you might see that in, let's say, radical political movements, radical social movements, radical feminist movements, might be countercultures. <clears throat> so when you talk about culture, which one do you mean, high culture or low culture? Which is important? And Korea is not a monolith. Korea is not one thing. I know it's very common to say Korea is a homogenous country and you might find some of that genetically, but in terms of culture, in terms of politics, in terms of many things, this homogenous, this homogeneity is not something that really always holds up. There is that Uri that I talked about, that identity, but the Korean Peninsula is divided in two. You have the regionalism, Gwangju and Daegu. You have the politics is really divided between the conservatives, the Bosudang, and the, the progressives, the Jimbodang. And Korea is always kind of divided in these things, and, and that's, that's natural. The idea of one culture unified is dubious so that doesn't really happen so culture is a hard thing to say is one it's the idea that you get here if you start thinking about it and analyzing it breaking it down it goes off in many different directions 
Taking the latter half of the Long Joseon Dynasty period, we can identify two distinct cultures, albeit with considerable commonality in music. The elite culture was dominated by Chinese influence, Confucian drenched monarchy, and the Yangban ruling class. The Sinocentric worldview valorized classical Chinese civilization, conveniently summarized in this period as being Confucian, with its stress on respecting the elders and ancestry, ancestors, hierarchy, patriarchy, tradition, and order. So you're looking at. That's really bad writing. Shall we try that one again? Uh, looking at. Shall we try that one one more time? I'm, I'm still getting to grips with this. I never know whether to look at the paper or this. Yu-Gi-Oh, which would have inside it the ideas of uh, in, which is like that. Um, ancestor respecting the elders, you'd have Hyo. Uh, patriarchy, tradition, you also have things like Ye, which is propriety. So this was one type of culture that was going on, this Confucian-drenched among the young ban, young ban, the young ban. Okay, I'm sure it's all very much understood to most of you. If you're an international student, these are some of the values inside Confucianism, as explained here. <clears throat> in contrast, in spite of its regional variations, the culture of the masses, or the peasantry, tended to be much more egalitarian and disorderly. So the masses or the people, the masses in it is an interesting word because if you look at this word, crassy, right? this word crassy, this means rule. So you have theocracy, plutocracy, bureaucracy. When you see C-R-A-C-Y, that means rule. This demo means the masses, uh, which is in Korea, it's like the inmin, the gukmin or the debubun. The mass is the majority. However, the majority's culture was not like this. So while the this would have been the high culture and the, the lower culture would have been much different. It's described as egalitarian. So it's more minjujui jokoro. It's, it's more equal. There's less gechung. There's less hierarchy. So whereas this one would have been more triangular, this one would have been not a straight line, but up and down because it's uh, disorderly. The Confucian rituals of the elite, quiet and orderly, contrasted with the shamanistic rites of the masses, emotional and expressive. In terms of music, the courtly performances of Chinese-derived instruments stood in sharp contrast to the popular performance of folk tunes and drums. The former seemed to be all about harmony and order. The latter appeared to exemplify energy and chaos. To invoke the European categories of contrast, Apollonian versus Dionysian. This is something you'll find in Friedrich Nietzsche. So uh, it's quite hard, I guess, for some young students to read Nietzsche. But uh, for Nietzsche, the human being had two sides, the Apollonian and the Dionysian. And the Apollonian was all about rational thinking, order, nolli, and, and logic. And the Dionysian was all about embracing revelry and wine and partying and to be a, a human being you had to embrace both of these if you were one only one you were missing out on sides and that's what john lee is saying the korean society was like in the late Joseon dynasty there was the this would be this one the apollian like this and this would have been the dionysian the uh the, the pansori, not pansori, but the uh, gugak, the nodong, these kind of people here. The ideal typical contrast exaggerates the distance between the two musical cultures. Both traditions were broadly pentatonic in line with much of Asia. Furthermore, the Confucianization of the Korean peninsula during the long dynastic rule integrated the soundscape. At times, the influence flowed upwards. Pansori, recitation accompanied by a drum which began as a popular genre became increasingly prestigious and embraced by the Confucian elite. So this is an example of where something like pansori, which was a popular genre, eventually became prestigious. So it went from mass culture and 
it came over into elite culture. It was adopted. This happens if you look at, um, if you'll find ideas of the core and the periphery. My pen stopped working. Which I think you'll find in somebody like Wallace Dean's work, where the periphery outside of the culture, they start producing something and then these people say, well, that's pretty cool. We're going to take that. And so things go from here and they're transferred into here. And of course, it might go the other way as well. Pansori is an example given. In practice, by the beginning of the 20th century, there was something of a common musical culture in the Korean peninsula. Its musical register was pentatonic, which is a, you have lots of scales in music. The pentatonic is the most widely recognizable one in Western music, uh, it's similar to sort of the rock or the blues, itself a regional marker across East Asia. The dominant singing style stressed emotive wails and melismatic expressions. While dancing, both in its courtly and country articulations, existed, it was placed explicitly outside the boundary of music. Singers, by and large, stood still during their vocal performances. The body was Confucian, not only preserving the parental gift, but also avoiding any display of the flesh. The singer's still and enveloped body expressed serious spiritual messages in the form of moralizing lyrics such as parental and familial love. The sensibility of Korean music then was in harmony with the cultural sensibility of Confucian Korea. Notice how it's giving you the traditional view here and how that's changed when you watch K-pop modern performances today. This is a very interesting line saying the body was Confucian, the body was covered, the body wasn't revealing anything, it was serious, the movements, you know when you do uh, Confucian rituals or when you just do anything in Korean society where you give with two hands, you receive with two hands, you shake like this, everything is very, there's a formality to something and it's ex trying to explain that the body uh, traditionally in these things was Confucian. We'll continue. The advent of the modern. It's a very interesting question. When did the modern start and begin? In one reading of post-traditional, post-Choson dynasty Korea, the incursion of the modern, primarily through Japan before the liberation in the United States after 1945, signaled a relentless retrenchment of the traditional. In the realm of music, the simple reading captures the dominant trend. Traditional music gave way to Japanese and Western genres. The popular that had been equivalent to the folk receded as the new popular music. Itself more a product of the culture industry rather than an emergent expression of the people reverberated through the peninsula. So as the modern comes in, here you can see that John Lee is suggesting that the modern modernity came through Japan and then the United States after 1945. And this meant that the traditional retreated. So the traditional retreated and the modern came in and the modern came in through Japan and the US. So you'd have 1910 to 1945 and the US was 1945 to 1948. That was the American military government. And then the ROK starts 1948 and the Isang Man. Uh, so this is what it's saying, the modern came from here and as these things came in, ideas of the traditional went away. In the 1876 Treaty of Kangwa, if, sorry, if the 1876 Treaty of Kangwa opened the Hermit Kingdom to Western influences, then the brute reality of power politics meant the predominance of Japan until the end of the colonial period. It is largely through Japanese channels that urban Koreans became attuned to Western musical forms, from classical music to popular genres such as ballads and tanton. It is not that Western music was merely emulated in Japan or Korea. As I elaborate, elaborate below, the pentatonic scale continued to dominate, in contradistinction to the diatonic of Western popular music, and lyrics were translated, adapted and created to fit local sensibilities. It is possible to argue that Japanese enka or Korean trot trot emerged as a fused and musical genre, somewhat as African and European music forms generated blues and bluegrass, jazz and country 
in the United States. Given the Japanese rule over Korea, including cultural production and musical education, the Japanese influence over Korean musical sensibilities was profound. The period of Japanese domination gave way, dominance, gave way to the US dominance in South Korea after liberation. The US occupation and its aftermath brought popular American music, not only jazz and blues, but also pop and rock via the US armed forces, radio and television, US military camp town bars and dance halls, and movie theaters that largely showed Hollywood films. The era of American cultural dominance, the 1950s and 60s, affected an ever larger population. Rapid and compressed urbanization brought South Koreans in close proximity to imported cultural products, which in turn disseminated by means of modern commun communication technologies, radio, movies, and television. Compressed urbanization. So this would have been in Seoul, lots of slums and poor living on the outskirts of Seoul. But you also had amongst all of this in Seoul, you'd have had the US armed forces, you would have had the bars in the dance halls, you would have had uh, this the soldiers there playing rock music, having Western culture, and this would have seeped into the Korean culture there. And it would have been exacerbated by modern communication technology, such as radios, movies and television. It didn't always have to be live but more and more of it, it was. We do know that while Park Tong-hee was very much against a lot of this sort of happy smoke movement and the hippie movement, he thought it was a danger, um, putting people like Shin jung hyun in jail because it was a threat to the nation's security because of the communist threat of North Korea. He was also very happy to get American soldiers money through bars and through uh, prostitutes and things like that so that would have increased those areas nonetheless if we consider the musical consumption of South Korea in the 1970s a time of rapid economic growth authoritarian politics and considerable social dislocation it would falsify the simple claim of US popular cultural dominance traditional folk songs remained popular especially in the countryside in urban areas, in spite of the elite embrace of Western classical music, the prevalent popular music was trot, a Korean variant of Japanese enka. Notice what the author is saying here. So the, the trot was embraced, or the enka, which it was uh, from, was embraced by the masses and in the countryside. Shigoleso. And the Western pop or, or the Western music, it's suggesting, was embraced by the elite. There was an elite embrace of Western classical music. So different parts of Korea like different types of music. And the people were really into uh, this one and the elites were into the Western music something worth thinking about indeed south korean popular music in the immediate post-liberation decades was deeply influenced by contemporary japanese popular music even as the south korean government banned japanese cultural products i think we talked about this last week how it was kim Dae-jung that opened them back up but south korea was deeply influenced by contemporary japanese popular music despite the south korean government banning it 19 mid to late 90s when the Japanese products became popular again we might have just missed something here it is not surprising however that the dictatorial president Park who grew up under the Japanese rule embraced trot and enka the regime banned Yimi Jia's widely popular song Dongbek Agashi in 1965 for its malign Japanese influence which was done in part to appease the popular resistance to the normalization treaty with Japan Hypocritical, hypocritical though it may have been, it was apparently one of his favourite songs that he requested to be sung in the privacy of Blue, the Blue House, the South Korean presidential mansion. So, Yimi Jia's Dongbek Agashi, you imagine that this song was banned. Why was this song banned? Because it the Japanese influence. So that's how strong uh, the government were at those times. If you think that this No Japan movement or things at the moment between Hanil Gwangye 
are bad, that they've been always there. Although, what we do, what this does suggest is that uh, Pak Tung Hee himself liked the music. He was a fan of it, but it was to try to uh, calm down the people because of the 1965 normalization. So in 1965, uh, in terms of Hanil Gwangye, Korea and Japan signed a treaty uh, that they had diplomatic relations with each other and that they were now at peace with each other and everything related to the colonial period from 1910 to 1945 was finalized. They signed a deal, it was finished. The Japanese gave South Korea a lot of money. Uh, they signed a contract and it was done. So it's saying it might have been in part, not wholly, but in part to appease the popular resistance to the Normalization Treaty. And the resistance to the Japanese would have possibly been here in the masses and in the countryside rather than amongst the elites. So you're still getting this division of culture between the two. Enkor or trot performance usually employed ostensibly Western presentation, lyrical matters of love and longing, for example, that recalled blues and with an orchestral accompaniment, but singers belted out tunes employing the pentatonic scale. That is, the register of Korean and Japanese music sensibility remained stubbornly rooted in traditional music meters. Performers usually stood still, dressed in traditional ethnic garb or conservative Western outfit and projecting an utterly respectable appearance. The contrast to the gyrating Elvis, Elvis or the ruffian Rolling Stones could not have been more apparent. So even with the influences coming from other places with Japan or Western music when they were doing that, the point here that he mentioned earlier is that the body, the body remains Confucian at that time it didn't matter too much about the genre but the body remained confucian the respectable respectable appearance uh traditional or conservative things that you would associate with that Jo young pil is a consensus superstar of south korean popular music 70s and 80s although he dabbled in several musical styles including his early infatuation with rock music his initial popularity owed to Trot, that he sang in traditional Pansori style. Suggestively, he claims to have mimicked the traditional training of Pansori singers, which entailed destroying one's vocal cords by singing loudly and repeatedly in the woods. Suggesting the persistent proximity of Japanese and Korean cultures, some of his songs became very popular in Japan in the 1970s, something of a har harbinger of the Korean wave. Yet his music was almost inevitably in the pentatonic scale. He sang without moving, employed melismatic, melismatic what? And pansori singing techniques, and relied on his vocal skills rather than on his looks to achieve stardom. Although he attempted many distinct musical genres, his musical life personified the South Korean popular music of the time, usually dubbed Gaio. Not surprisingly, the ambit of Cho's appeal remained restricted to the Korean and Japanese cultural spheres of influence, only extending haphazardly to Taiwan and other pockets of Japanophilia. It would be difficult indeed to imagine Cho's rapturous reception in 1970s New York or Paris, Jakarta or Lima. Drenched in national markers, though in fact shared by Japanese and others, Cho's music signified Koreanness, which rendered it alien to those uninitiated to the national culture and the dominant musical style. To be sure, national boundaries were policed. Not only did many governments practice an aggressive policy of cultural nationalism, but tariffs and other forms of import restrictions kept all but a handful of musical forms from being almost exclusively nationalist. It's a very interesting idea that's going here. So the music in the 1970s from people like Cho Young Pil wouldn't have been received well in New York, Paris, Jakarta, or Lima because the music was drenched in national markers. There were many, there was a lot of Koreanness in Korean music. 
that's why if we're looking here the Choyong Pil time in the 1970s there was a lot of Koreanness in national markers although this Koreanness would have also included he's trying to suggest uh, a Japanese-ness a shared combination of the two however because it had this Koreanness which we could put like that to make it a bit more understandable foreigners wouldn't have enjoyed or understood it hmm? he says here um, which rendered it alien to those uninitiated, uninitiated to the national culture and the dominant dominant musical style so if you didn't know anything about korea and you heard the korean music you would find it weird it wouldn't immediately appeal to you there would be something in there that uh, didn't quite grab you because the music at the time was still very it was specific rather than general that's one uh, thing that you could take from this if you accept john lee's arguments in this you could say 1970s K music was specific rather than general it was very specific to the korean culture and the history the temporal and spatial conditions and because it was so specific so korean it it didn't really appeal to the general so that was one of the things at the time <clears throat> The principal exception was classical music and musicians. Western classical music had long superseded traditional Confucian or Korean court music among the elite, percolating downward in the status hierarchy such that piano instruction became de rigueur among socially aspiring households. Not surprisingly, some of the earliest ethnic Korean successes in the world of music came from Western classical music composers and performers, such as Lee Sang-yoon, Kang Hwa-chung. American pop music, especially rock, but also jazz, folk and other genres, was a distinct presence in many countries, including the peripheral status it enjoyed in South Korea. Yet, by and large, the nationalist, involute and traditional state of South Korean popular music would not have differentiated it from any number of countries in the 1970s. This idea, just to go back to here, about the piano, that piano instruction... move this advertisement thank you advertisement great piano instruction became de rigueur it became the thing it became more normal it's kind of tangyoni ilbanjo among socially aspiring households so once more if we had this that the masses and the elite here while the elite loved the western classical music and they even rated it above traditional korean music it says in here it slowly started filtering down and so for normal people just regular citizens like you or i the piano which you associate with classical music started becoming the thing and it became the thing because people aspired to go up to the elite or higher culture it became a sign if you uh, if you played the piano you were more sophisticated you were more educated you were less rural or shigol jogoro you were going upwards. If we continue. The drift toward the global. So we mentioned that the specific and the genre, the specific and the general. Now it's going uh, to the global in this part. Critical transformation was a shift in scale from the traditional pentatonic to the Western and by now global diatonic. To be sure, it is not that music composed in pentatonic scale cannot become popular consider only the Japan, Japanese of some of Debussy's compositions, but a sure way to alienate an audience is to play music in alien registers and scales. New and alien music may be received as being tantamount to noise, an object of visceral dislike. Hence, just as South Koreans looking for something new or just good in popular music in the 1970s embraced someone like the Japanese folk singer Itsuwa Mayumi, they were slower to accept the alien sound of Western rock music. There was, in short, a chasm between Cho and Elvis Presley or the Beatles, much less Pink Floyd or Led Zeppelin. The musical distance between South Korea and the United States remained significant. Nonetheless, the distance was to narrow rapidly in the ensuing two or three decades. So while for South Koreans, the 
Japanese music and US or Western music because obviously Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Beatles, they're not the US, they're English. Haha. <laughs> For South Koreans, both of these music styles are foreign. They're both foreign. However, because of the similarities, it's mentioning here the success of Itsuwa Mayumi, because of the similarities in the presentation, in the styles and the tones, especially the scales they use, the pentatonic, that they could more readily accept the Japanese ones than the US and Western ones. These ones were still hard because they were so different pink floyd's music or led zeppelin's music says here just sounded like uh noise they couldn't understand it they didn't have the code inside their br head to make sense of it so it wasn't just korean music and foreign music but korean music and what it was close to and at the time it was very very far away from us and western music it didn't really translate but it would slowly become more popular here As I suggested, the pervasive U.S. cultural influence in the post-liberation period saturated South Korean landscape with American and Western music, with its almost inevitable deployment of the diatonic scale. Certainly, formal music education almost always imparted Western theories, prized above all was the Western classical tradition. Hence, many South Koreans had at least passing familiarities with Western sounds, including most orchestral instruments. Few South Koreans by the 1970s had never heard a piece of Western music. Western musical instruments from trumpet to timpani were also increasingly common. There were certainly fans of Western popular music as well as native rendition of Western pop song, such as Shin Jung Hyun, uh, Kim Joo Ah, Kim Jong Mi, the Pearl Sisters and many others. The music appealed to the younger generation, which could only stealthily listen to Japanese pop music. Yet the Park regime also re resisted American-style pop music, speculating fantastically that Kim Joo-ja's gesticulations may have been covert messages to North Korea. More conveniently, the authoritarian government worried about the corrupting effects of American music in South Korea. As much as the North Korean government has resisted it during the post-liberation period, for rock, after all, was associated with sex, drug and political deviance. Shin, for example, was embroiled in a marijuana scandal in 1975 and, along with his associates, such as Kim Shu Ja, Kim Jong Mi, suspected of anti-government sentiments. As with virtually everything deemed even remotely anti-government and pro-communist, many of their songs were banned. So different music styles, I said that the American music styles were foreign because of the instruments, they were foreign because of the instruments, because of the scales, or the diatonic, and the orchestration, but also the government then portrayed the foreign music at the time as being you know, related to North Korea, it was trying to communize the country, or it was going to get rid of the morals and bring drugs and political deviance. And while these things might have been accepted as such by the masses in their shamanistic rituals and that type of behavior for the elite who were trying to control the country, who were trying to deal with national security, these things were very bad. So the elite reaction to foreign music was to shut it down. It was to arrest people. It was to beat people up. It was to put them in prison to call them communists or Baigangis and really discredit people as much as they could. And of course, you know, during uh, ex-President Park, Park, Park Geun-hye, uh, President Park's reign, there was the idea of blacklists of artists, of course, that would have been continued under conservative governments. The very performance of self-consciously Western music sensibilities distinguished some South Koreans from others stubbornly dwelling in the traditional sound world. A South Korean who expressed enthusiasm for Led Zeppelin, no less than other waxing ecstatic about Beethoven, would have exemplified elitism and even snobbery. In spite of stubborn support among small segments, rock and pop became disarticulated from the mainstream of student and anti-government movements in South Korea. The increasing intertwinement of anti-government sentiments 
and people's movements generated its own popular music genres, especially folk, not unlike that of Bob Dylan or Joan Baez in the guise of Kim Min Ji and others. Even more than the mainstream pop music, the leftist popular music was inscribed with moral seriousness and political engagement. The right and left converged in the message of seriousness, shacking popular music to the tether, the serious and the respectable, thereby pushing it toward the margin. So here you have the Minzu, which was also looked at in the, uh, what do you call it, the Undongguan. Especially amongst universities, um, really rose up after 1980s Guangzhou, of course. Uh, but the Minjung movement, student movement generally, started on university campuses. But trying to acknowledge the Minjung movement, I, I'll put it over here, was beginning to acknowledge or to uh, identify political oppression. Because many people in many countries, uh, they might live at the bottom of society. They might be downtrodden, they might be oppressed, but they might not do anything about it for various reasons. There's been no social revolutions in, in North Korea or, or things like that. Uh, think of China, you have the Tiananmen Square, but other than that, there's not this sort of real rising from the bottom. And the Minjung movement like to trace itself back to the, uh, would it be the Donghak? Eastern learning, is that Dong or that Dong? Eastern learning, the Dong hack, the uprising which goes to the Gabo reforms, but it was about identifying political oppression and rising up above it. And here, these people, it wasn't so much about Led Zeppelin or Beethoven, it was more about folk music, about sort of Bob Dylan. Um, I almost want to think of Kim Gwang Sok, but that's a bit later. So. Led Zeppelin and Beethoven was for the elite, was for the oppressors. And for the Minjung movement or the Undongguan, you would find more folk music. So again, the music, what type of music you listen to was politically divided. All right. There's this idea that you could tell somebody's political allegiance. Do they like this thing or this thing? by looking at their stereo, or by looking at their radio, looking at their albums or CDs, something like that. That also ties into the idea that Korea is not one. So in the beginning, you had the this suggestion that you have high culture, low culture, you have the Apollonian and the Dionysian, you have this and this, that Korea is not just one thing, it's still continuing that idea that even in the 1970s or 60s Korean music styles and listening were divided. These people listen to this and these people listen to this. So it was a, um, I would say, music was political, but music was a, let's say, a cultural signifier. So it signified something. This is going into, uh, I guess, like Fernand de Saussure. You could look at his work if it interests you, but it was a cultural signifier. It signified something about you culturally. It said something, who you are and what you were. In the 1970s, the most politically and culturally oppressive decade in post-liberation South Korea, Park regime banned not only ostensibly conservative music, such as trot for Japanese influences, but also progressive music, such as rock, for its association with corruption and decadence. Musically stayed folk songs, in turn, often aired anti-government messages and were often banned as well. The authoritarian regime relied not only on anti-communism, but also nationalism and Confucianism to justify its culturally restrictive policy. The Confucian ideology restricted loud or political music and encouraged conservative dresses and gesticulations. Given the impoverished repertoire, it is not surprising that people sought refuge in banned Japanese and Korean music or sought American and Western alternatives. So, with Park Chung hee in charge, this music he banned for being Japanese and this music he banned because of its Western messages and he only allowed a smaller set of nationalistic, moralistic music. So 
the, the South Korean listening public where they would have had all this music to listen to before they were only allowed to have this amount and so because this music was pretty boring to them or it wasn't that interesting of course they went and sought this out again if you ban something people really want it as a pop music lyric might have it times changes everything south korean enrichment brought in its wake paraphernalia of popular entertainment most crucial was television which began broadcast in 1961 became a household necessity by the 1980s. A very popular genre was musical variety shows, usually featuring popular song, Gaio, which was an adaptation of a popular US and Japanese television genre. Even more spectacular was the widespread popularity of Norebang, which debuted in 1991. As places to engage in karaoke singing, Karaoke Machine was invented in 1967 in Japan and became popular there in the course of the 1970s. It became one of the most popular forms of entertainment for the young and the old. Widespread popularity of Norebang, which debuted in 1991. It seems so commonplace, so everywhere, so almost so old now. Uh, 1991. Along with the dissemination of portable listening devices, especially the appearance of Sony Walkman in the 70s, technological transformation facilitated reproduction and production of popular music. Listening and singing popular music became a national pastime, albeit replete with generational and other divides in taste. Out of the National Music Fest arose a new, a new post gaio genre that was distinctly contemporary and Western in sensibility and sound. So there was a change from gaio to post gaio Post here is afterwards. Okay, So you have rock, post-rock. You have punk and post-punk. Uh, what comes after that thing? What comes after? So there's a new one. Change is inevitably quantitative and gradual, but often expresses itself as a qualitative jump. Here about change, you can have paradigm change. You can have episteme change. This is the idea of Foucault. So paradigm change is just when one part of the genre changes. The episteme is when the whole society or the, the, the whole way of thinking changes. But in society there you know society will be going along and all of a sudden there will be a change there'll be a paradigm shift maybe there'll be something else you know there are developments here we're seeing one in the korean music <clears throat> for the purposes of making sense of k-pop that quantum leap was the emergence of sotejian boys it was one of the first groups to incorporate rap music and hip-hop sensibilities to south korean popular music Needless to say, they had jettisoned the traditional pentatonic in favour of the contemporary diatonic. No longer did we have the soul-screeching wails of melismatic singing, but the percussive and syllabic singing signalling the urban call. What made their music innovative was that it did not sound Korean. As some critics remarked at the time, it sounded strange. To temper the claim of their originality and revolutionary impact, I should mention the impact not only of a generation of American popular music disseminated by music videos since 1980s, but also of J-pop, a distinct Japanese popular music genre that became dominant in the 1980s. So in terms of time, J-pop in the 1980s, and it says here that it coincided with the end of an era and it did not sound Japanese. So it, looking at these studies down here of J-pop, it signalled a change, just like the arrival of Soteji signalled a change, but it also signalled a political change. So in 1992, you're looking at Kim Yong Sam, which is the first non-military president, Park Chung Hee, Chun Do Wan, No Tae Woo, and then Kim Yong Sam. So although Kim Yong Sam was in the Bosu Dang at the time with uh, Kim Jong Pil, he was the first non-army person for 32 years. So that's kind of a change. Here in, in Japan as well, there was also a change. And these changes bring this new music which doesn't sound traditional. So Soteji didn't sound Korean, and the J-pop, when that came, didn't sound Japanese. So's group was important not only in pioneering a new musical landscape that became almost invariably Western pop music, but also introducing dance as a critical element of their performance. To be sure, there were others such as Kim Ju Chao, Kim Chong Mi in the 70s, as well as Kim Wan Son or So Bang Tai in the late 1980s, who had sought to incorporate dancing in performance. 
Yet in bringing together the latest American trends in sound and movement, Sotogi and Boys announced themselves as something new in South Korean popular music. The MTV revolution, post-Michael Jackson innovations in marrying singing and dancing in popular music, and the hip-hop turn coalesced in Sotogi and the Boys. Critical resistance was predictable. What was less predictable was the embrace by South Korean youths. So I think Sotogi and Boys was 1992 with Nan Arayo, which would be something like I know, I guess, in, in the West. Um, to me, that you go and watch it now and the dancing looks kind of funny and, and things like this. It was uh, very much the use of... I need to make sure I get this name right. It's New Jack style. It's a style of music that was adopted by uh, bands such as New Kids on the Block. And things like this. That was the popular style. So if I listen to Sotaji and Nanaro, that kind of music sounds very familiar to me. It sounds very natural. Well, it sounds very of its time. But for the South Koreans, there was critical resistance. Yeah? The critics hated it. I believe on the audition show, when they debuted, they came last, right? and people didn't like Sotaji and Boys, but it was embraced by the youth. That's the important thing there. So when I broke down things in terms of elite or masses and, and different sides, who likes what culture, this one was particularly, it was the youth that liked it. Another interesting dimension is So and his colleagues seeming independence from politics. Popular music in advanced industrial societies tends to be disengaged from overt politics, despite numerous exceptions and objections. In South Korea, as we have seen, the realm of popular music was hardly innocent of po politics. The traditional right-wing association of trot, though simultaneously incurring the nationalist wrath of being Japanese, and the left-wing embrace of folk song and other people's music, including traditional peasant music. This is, of course, not surprisingly, in an authoritarian polity with a great deal of cultural surveillance. So if it was this type of music, you were right wing. And if it was this type of music, you were right wing and left wing. But because the music was new, it wasn't because Soteji and Boys was new. It wasn't associated with this or this. So it sort of transcended traditional... political divides it went above them the post seoul olympics democratic south korea by the early 1990s had begun to shed the overt politicization of everyday life including popular music although sotaji and the boys is far from the only act to embody its autonomy from the entangled politics of the 80s and before they struck a resonant political chord for the increasingly affluent youths liberated from the demands of anti-government politics. The rise of K-pop. <clears throat> Till the mid-1990s, the very idea of exporting South Korean popular music would have struck most South Koreans as bizarre. Except for occasional trot singers with warm receptions in Japan and Taiwan, and perhaps explicitly Americanized performers such as Patti Kim or classical musicians, the South Korean music industry was resolutely domestic in orientation and consumption. It is in retrospect precisely around this period that there were murmurs of the Korean wave in Chinese language areas, Taiwan, Hong Kong, even mainland China. The very concept of Hallyu, which had hitherto referred to the wind hailing from the Korean peninsula, spread rapidly in East Asia, signaling the coming of South Korean popular culture. Uh, it says here the origin of this concept is undoubtedly up for a lengthy and fruitless debate. Surely it did not take a stroke of genius to come up with a readily available term. You can see Merton for a really big discovery of it. But Hallyu was already there, so it was just applied. It wasn't invented, but applied according to John Lee. The Korean wave, at least in its initial articulation, seemed to be all about South Korean soap opera especially critical, even beyond its circulation in the Chinese language, language spheres, was the phenomenal popularity of the 2002 KBS drama series Winter Sonata, which became an overnight sensation in Japan, heralded for many the beginning of the Korean wave, coming as it did on the heels of the joint hosting between Japan and South Korea of the 2002 World Cup. 
In spite of the popularity of South Korean television dramas that entrenched the idea of the Korean wave, the initial referent included South Korean music groups such as H.O.T. and Baby Vox. By the late 2000s, however, the driving force of the Korean wave, at times dubbed the Korean wave 2.0, seemed to have shifted to the rapid ascent of K-pop. So in John Lee here, just to make this idea of 2002 winter sonata because we're talking about politics and the korean wave and how music is tied to politics how that's associated and we had japan south korea world cup because of the current trade war between korea and japan and with the third which is the missile defense system. When this happened, there was trouble between K-pop in Japan and, and the artists here. It caused ruptures in the, the music industry. And with the THAAD, uh, deployment of THAAD in South Korea, the Chinese, they, they started canceling K-pop gigs and they started sending people home and banning here. So you have to remember that it always is political and especially in Asia because of the relationships between Asian countries. When uh, the president that went to see Chairman Kim Jong-un one time took with him red velvet and acts like that. So the music is always tied into politics. And you might have to think about Korean success that when the politics between Asian nations are going well, okay, so if you have uh, like peace or cooperation and you have here, success of k pop when there's peace then the success of k pop might go up but when there's conflicts and that going down it might come down obviously this is a bit extreme but the success of k pop amongst asia will be tied in always to broader geopolitical events that you need to pay attention to the other thing i want to have a look at here is a uh, korean wave and you also have Korean wave 2.0 okay so you know you have the fourth industrial revolution and, and things like this here you're getting one where the original Korean wave which you might put as say 1992 something like that would be based on TV and dramas whereas Korean wave 2.0 where you want to put that is up to you maybe 2002 five was now becoming driven by k-pop so it was still the wave it was still going overseas we said last time that it wasn't a single fountain of call but various ones and when this changed from the tv dramas to the music then it becomes maybe korean wave 2.0 because the main medium the main channel has changed how should we explain the seemingly sudden rise of K-pop in the early 21st century? The myth of the market in this case, a more or less spontaneous emergence of a supply of desirable commodities called South Korean popular music, is far from adequate to make sense of it. It's not just economic. It's not just the market. It's not just about desirable commodities, having lots of products. There's something more than having products. Rather, we need to consider several contexts and contingencies that render K-pop inextricably intertwined with the very fabric of South Korean economy, society and culture. I've already signaled the arrival of South Korean popular music to the prevailing America-led norm by the 90s. Yet Japan, for example, surely had a larger pool of talented and dedicated popular music performers. But in spite of the interest in J-pop, Japanese performers never garnered overseas success that K-pop stars had achieved by 2010. So, what was it in K-pop that wasn't in J-pop? South Korean economic growth self-consciously stressed the centrality of export orientation since the late 1960s. There's a lot of the economic background here because of time. I'm going to skip a little bit of this and I'm sure many of you already know it. Hopefully you've read it. One of the key points that you want to focus here is the export orientation. The idea that because Korea has no natural resources, you need to make things and 
because there are no natural resources you need to make things and export them not sure if you know about this but there's one concept called the resource curse c u r s e the resource curse and this says countries that do have natural resources don't get economic development because their resources are plundered if you have too many diamonds or oil then the great powers from abroad come and take it so having no resources might have been a good thing for south korea it's good to have no resources because then south korea developed as i say um this section just charts the economic development let's go from here needless to say opportunity needs to be seized and two transformations were critical First, the post-Cold War globalization vitiated the hitherto high walls of cultural protectionism in East Asia and elsewhere. It was, after all, only in 2002 that South Korea lifted, all, lifted ban on all restrictions to Japanese cultural imports. Although Japanese or Taiwanese walls of protection against South Korean cultural products were not as robust during the Cold War, there is no question that they weakened considerably in the 1990s and 2000s. In any case, all these countries had long accepted the very category of pop music, its standard format of three or four minute songs of love and other adolescent themes. Consider only the increasingly positive Japanese outlook on South Korea and Koreans, which was a sea kwan non for the blockbuster success of Winter Sonata. South Korea was able to take advantage of cultural globalization in part because of its large and far-flung diasporic population provided a ready source of information and expertise, whether in the form of appraising distinct national trends in popular music or in the guise of singers, dancers and composers. Because the Cold War ended, what dates you give to the Cold War are very different, but let's say 1947 to 1990, 1991. Because that had ended, the world wasn't just based on... Uh, good guys and bad guys the world wasn't just based on uh, capitalism and communism because when it was like that you couldn't accept the other you were always in danger of your culture you were always worried that communism was going to start creeping in that capitalism was going to start creeping in so there was a very strict barrier about accepting other people's cultures across these during the cold war it's very serious so when the cold war ended and of course that led to american unipolarity for a little while then it became easier for japanese taiwanese and korean products cultural products to switch with each other you can see that in 2002 there also we have this idea the diasporic population so um is that the right spelling gyo pyo gyo po that's not the right spelling gyo po um so the diasporic possession, uh, diaspora population, people living overseas, and because there was a large amount of Korean people overseas, saying here, they were able to tell you what was cool. They were able to tell Korea what was cool in the West, what was happening. Also, they were allowed to bring, or they were able to bring singers, dancers, composers, something that still happens today. So that really gave Korea an advantage in that it had people overseas to help bring in this thing. technology uh you know a little bit about that i'm going to skip some bits just because i'm looking at time and we need to make sure uh we get a lot of this here are a lot of the acts that come let's get down to this why k-pop and the k k-pop as i've already discussed the heightening regional demand east asia in particular and asian in general for modern popular music not only had there been a global convergence of pop culture norms exemplified most clearly in lyrics the idea of romantic love, for example, but also in the very nature of acceptable and accessible musical performance. The percussive beats, the diatonic scale, syllabic singing, the fusion of voice and dance across East Asia. Precisely at a time when enrichment allowed greater demands of the youth market for cultural consumption, national barriers were lowered. Yet why not demand the global standards of American pop music? The short answer is that a substantial segment of the East Asian youth population did look to American and European performers, 
just as much as many of them remained loyal to the more local, national traditions of popular music. What K-pop did was to fill a niche that was relatively open for clean, well-crafted performers. It is also possible that physical resemblance, something like racial isomorphism, may have accentuated the appeal of K-pop to other East Asians, but it is more likely that they filled the gap left vacant by the urbanised and sexualized American performers, celebrating sex and violence, replete with tattoos, and the staid, tried popular music of national, local national performers, in effect, their parents' music. <clears throat> Why did Korean K-pop succeed? Yes, it's economic. Yes, it's technological. Tech. No. I can spell, I just have to get used to it on this. Here's this idea of identity that it's bringing in. So in East Asia, if we call this place Southeast Asia or East Asia, on the one time was their on the one side was their parents' music, the traditional or the national music, and on the other side was the American music with uh, sexualized and tattoos and sex and violence. So it was decadent. And both of these were quite extreme. And the Americans, there wasn't the cultural affinity. They didn't look like each other. So what K-pop did is there was this gap in the middle for K-pop, according to John Lee, according to this article, there's this gap in the middle, this niche because K-pop is clean and it's quality and maybe a little bit because of the ethnic ideas. So it didn't have sex and violence. It wasn't too dangerous. It wasn't really political. It was, it was pretty clean, but also the quality was high. It wasn't just rubbish. And for Asian people, especially, it wasn't blonde haired people with blue eyes or any other different ethnic, but they could recognize some genetic similarities. So why K-pop or the K-wave was a success? These three qualities John Lee is pointing at because, not just because they existed, but because they existed between these two extremes. So there was a gap in the middle for this thing. That's why it came. K-pop exemplifies middle class, urban and suburban values that seek to be acceptable at once to college aspiring youths and their parents. A world that suggests nothing of inner city poverty and violence, corporal or sexual radicalism, or social deviance and cultural alienation. K-pop, in this sense, satisfied the emergent regional taste and sensibility, though it would be remiss to stress the region as its appeal could easily extend beyond it. The oft-repeated claims about K-pop singers' politeness, their clean-cut features, as well as their gentle demeanours, is something of a newly, nearly universal appeal, whether to Muslim Indonesians or Catholic Peruvians, this clean cut idea. Right? It's not decadent, it's not Western, it, it's not drenched in sex, although that might be changing a little bit, but in general, it's quite clean. And the, the K pop stars have to keep quite a clean image and reputation. It's not like Justin Bieber can have loads of girlfriends and smoke marijuana and, and, and do all these things. It's very different for these. So the clean cut is part of the thing that makes it popular. K-pop filled the niche in part because others did not do so. J-pop would have like been a likely candidate, but the combination of the large domestic market and the involute music industry made it a largely a domestic affair with only a cult following elsewhere. In the heydays of J-pop in the 1980s and 1990s, there were little incentives and considerable risks for music executives to seek international expansion. Some of the conditions I've stressed, cultural, glo cultural globalization, technological transformations were not ripe. Whereas the emerging Asian markets were small and therefore unprofitable, the South Korean market was virtually closed, for example, and manifold difficulties of scaling the cultural and economic barriers of the US market remained. At bottom, the large, relatively homogenous Japanese market provided ample product. So this idea of J-pop in the 1980s and 90s This didn't become a thing. It didn't become the uh, the, the J-wave because there were still too many borders. 
because the East Asian countries, they hadn't developed economically and because the Cold War politically was still going on, there was a lot of barriers there. And also because South Korea hadn't opened up its market. So at the time, J-pop, it didn't have the places to go. There were no markets for it to go out into. It was blocked off. However, by the time K-pop comes along, from 1992 with Soteji, but let's say in the 2000s, a bit more, with K-pop uh, and 2.0, there were more markets now. The Cold War had finished. Japan and South Korea were now exchanging cultural goods. The East Asian markets, they had money. They were developing. <clears throat> and there was uh, sort of some ethnic associations with Pan-Asianism. So the difference between J-pop and K-pop here might have been the external conditions. I hope that makes sense to you. It's not saying one is better than the other or one is good, but the external conditions were very important for why it, why it succeeded, for why it succeeded at the time. Let's continue. Let's try to finish. K-pop fills a large demand for those wetted by US-led pop music with its fusion of infectious beats and skillful dancing without its excesses. <clears throat> Here, South Korean groups sing pop tunes with simple earworm inducing melody, usually on the hegemonic pop music theme of love. Given the strong inflection of English lyric, it is difficult to decipher from listening just briefly whether the song is in Korean or any other language. The refrain of Girls' Generation Hit G is, for example, G, 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 baby, please don't make me say, which poses a very low hurdle for even those challenged in their English comprehension. In general, K pop performers are appropriate for the age of music videos, extremely photogenic, often enhanced by plastic surgery and other inventions. They exemplify sort of pop perfectionism, catchy tunes, good singing, attractive bodies, cool clothes, mesmerizing movements and other attractive attributes in a non-threatening, pleasant package. The language here is a, an interesting thing to consider that you don't know what language it is sometimes if you were just to give a 10 second part of the song and even if you don't speak English if you're from Singapore if you if you're Muslim you don't really know English or Korean this kind of language it, it's not hard you can get into that it's not difficult it's not Bob Dylan so that's really important one story I guess about girls generation Sonia Side is uh, I uh, did an interview briefly with those with with them on Mohandajon Mohandajon in Hongdae I didn't know who they were at the time. I didn't listen to K-pop. This must be 2007, 8, 2007, uh, and with no Hong Chal and Ha Ha, and they sang this song to me, and I had no idea what it was. I just went, oh yeah, that's very nice, okay. <laughs> it's very embarrassing for them. I felt very sorry. Now I know what it is, but at the time, rock and roll. It is also worth stressing that as a cultural export, K-pop had high production value. In part, it stems from a deep talent pool. In spite of the proliferation of popular music styles and the large supply of would-be singers, South Korea is also notable for the near absence of the independent music scene, which is vibrant, for example, in Japan. This is really interesting. So, there's no, there is an independent music scene. You know, you do have um, the Barbarettes, you do have Galaxy Express, you do have do come from that this indie music scene but it's pretty small it's not big compared to uh, Japan compared to Western countries so because the indie and we'll look at this at some point during the course because the indie scene is so small that makes k-pop so much bigger mm -hmm. because if you imagine that there's a market share of a hundred if the indie scene was this then that means mainstream is this. But if the indie stream is really small, it makes the mainstream bigger. So the, the shrinking of the indie scene over here has made the mainstream bigger. And because the mainstream is bigger, 
that means there are more people to choose from that means the quality is higher you don't have people in going over this way they're all stuck in the mainstream so the the small size of the independent music scene contributes to the quality and the performance of the k-pop we go back to the the noribang which was 1992 as i said or one terrible with numbers in a country in which perhaps the most popular form of entertainment is singing in noribangs or karaoke rooms becoming a k-pop star is at the top of the most desired profession for south korean youths probably not anymore given that the independent music scene is limited Many talented and trained singers seek K-pop careers in which the success rate of audition is said to be 1 in 2000. These would-be K-pop stars in addition undergo rigorous training for five years, which costs perhaps 200 to 300 million won. Then only 20 to 30 out of a thousand trainees ever appear professionally. The star factory or incubation system is professionally managed with stern discipline that may mean up to 100 hours of practice and lessons, including learning English or Japanese per week. Agencies such as SM Entertainment in turn seek eminent composers, choreographers, designers and stylists. K-pop, in short, is an explicit export-oriented culture industry popular in the sense that it is for, but not by, ordinary people. It's a really important quote if you want to understand somebody's definition of K-pop. You don't have to agree with this, but you should understand it and you write it down, perhaps. K-pop is and explicit that means it's not hidden it's deliberate it's it's out there explicit or export oriented designed to go outwards culture industry which is popular because it, it is for people but not by people it's not done by normal people it's not your stars i mentioned adele earlier sorry to mention adele again i must have adele seems like an ordinary person um, in, in terms of her physical, not her singing, she has the voice of, wow, 2,000 angels. But I mean, in terms of Adele's personality, in terms of Adele's uh, training, in terms of Adele's uh, physical appearance, <clears throat> Adele is an ordinary person. If you passed Adele in the street, you wouldn't say much if you passed k-pop star in the street maybe you would so k-pop is for ordinary people but not by ordinary people i think that's a very interesting uh to look at these jontisas these prepositions to get into so if you want how do you feel about this definition of k-pop does it make sense is it still true today press my buttons this one this one the talent pool extends not only to performers but also to backstage actors. Given South Korea's penchant for study abroad, the valorization of prestigious, often meaning foreign diplomas, there is an overpopulation of people trained in music composition, dance, choreography, stage design, many other aspects important to creating a viable, popular music industry. Furthermore, South Korean business practice is export oriented, but it also imports and outsources readily, seeking best talent from abroad. South Korea, in addition, is blessed by a sizable diaspora. Lee Soo Man once said in an interview that South Korea has best consumed black music in Asia. Just as J-pop was built on rock, we made K-pop based on black music. Given the wide popularity of black music, it is not a mere coincidence that Korean Americans who learned hip-hop music and allied dancing techniques in situ, in turn, brought them directly to South Korea. You might also want to consider how you feel about Isuman's uh, comments on K-pop being based on black music. One of the things we might look into is cultural appropriation. Is it okay for Western people to wear handbooks? Is it okay uh, to Justin Bieber to wear dreadlocks? Is it okay to to take somebody else's culture to take? somebody else's culture and appropriate it and use it for yourself so there are some arguments about this and depends whether anybody owns a type of music but there are many articles about uh, k-pop's cultural appropriation of black music that's especially important considering uh, isuman's quotes there the K-pop industry is dominated by several talent agencies which share not only a global outlook and ambition, but a keen business sense. 
it would be difficult to stress the way in which K-pop is a business in which financial and other business concerns consistently trump musical or artistic considerations. Financial and business concerns are more important than musical or artistic concerns in K-pop, according to John Lee. To take one example, consider the proliferation of groups rather than solo acts. The formation of groups is predicated not only on an economy of scale, it is less expensive to train a group rather than individuals one by one, but they render backup singers and dancers otios, which would cost money to train and hire them. Having many members provide not only an insurance against illness and injuries, but also enable agencies to use them separately. One member can act in a television drama, for example, another might be attending a meeting of a fan club. Different members can appeal to different fans. Sonia Shide, for example, has nine members of varying shape and size, including members proficient in English, Japanese and Chinese, who in turn take a leading role when performing in non-Korean stages. Group structure is thus dictated in part by cold-blooded business calculations. That it proved to be a successful formula reinforced its format goes without saying. It's a very interesting idea that it's the economy of scale which makes groups important. K-pop individuals are much more expensive. Qua business, K-pop entrepreneurs replicate South Korean modality of conducting business. This should not be surprising in and of itself, but it also undercuts claims that look largely to the talented performers or to the invisible hand of market mechanism. K-pop enthusiasm in Japan has generated a vocal minority, operating largely in the blogosphere. Castigating K-pop as earlier enthusiasm for the Korea wave drama inspired an anti-Korean wave movement. Some of the more sensational claims focus on K-pop business practices, which are said to be improper, if not illegal, such as the non-standard margins of profitability of Japanese partners or the dispensation of sexual favours. I think we've seen lots of this with uh, Guhara and Sully and the Me Too uh, movements. You also have something in there with, uh, it doesn't mention, but the idea of slave contracts, which became a big thing in K-pop, in which the people are, performers not allowed to have boyfriends or girlfriends for six, seven years, it was reduced to five years. So there are critics against it. Although information is extremely difficult to verify, there is no norm of openness in entertainment industry contracts. It appears to be the case that South Korean talent agencies often offer extremely attractive deals for local agencies to promote and market K-pop groups. So there might be it's the way that uh, the way that South Korea does business. This is saying here, like uh, Samsung or Hyundai, the big conglomerates. By that I mean Chebols. And they have this huge power uh, and, and with this you do get this idea of economic gaptil uh, they monopolize the uh, industries and they do what they want saying that the the k-pop entrepreneurs they replicate this they they take these uh table gaptil styles and they incorporate them into the music is one of the claims that john lee is saying here And saying this is what they did there. Um, let's let's skip this paragraph. But <clears throat> well, this, we may very well see attempts by South Korean entrepreneurs to include not only foreign members but also to establish distinct non-Korean performers. Well, this is true. We're seeing uh, well, Blackpink uh, with its members, and all all the bands are slowly putting not just it used to be South Korean members that could speak different languages but now it's different nationalities are, are being put in there. Finally, the South Korean state has backed the Korean wave and K-pop. From its traditional role as a censor, the government has become a promoter of popular culture. Kim Dae-jung, elected as the president of the country in 1997, sought to become a culture president and promised to devote 1% of government expenditure on cultural content. Even the conservative Im young bak elected in 2007, has sought to promote brand Korea and enhance South Korea's soft power. K-pop, to put it hyperbolically, is almost a representative national culture and industry. The domain of government support ranges from favourable financial arrangements to cultural promotion. So those last few paragraphs were 
criticizing perhaps some of the the things that people have said about k-pop let's have a look at this last section the k in k-pop or, or the point that we're coming to the appeal of k-pop to non-korean audiences both across asia and beyond is in a pattern with south korean export products such as Samsung or hyundai that have broad appeal precisely because of the combination of reasonable price and dependable quality it is of course trivially korean in the sense that the singers and producers are almost exclusively ethnic koreans albeit with a fair sprinkling of emigre and diasporic South Koreans, and the South Korean government and fandom alike take some pride in the Koreanness of K-pop. Yet, as a matter of traditional culture, there is almost nothing Korean about K-pop. K-pop, however, identified as part of brown South Korea, is a globally competitive product without encumbrance of traditional Korea. So, it's... Let's not say cheap, that's not the point. It's reasonably priced and it's good quality and not traditional Korea and that's what we think of export so if we buy a phone or, or something like that in the West we don't buy it because it's Korean we don't buy Samsung phones because they're Korean we buy them because they're good quality and the price is reasonable and it doesn't it seems modern so it's not the koreanness in the thing that makes people attracted to it it's other qualities however people take pride in the collective achievements of k-pop which is good there's nothing wrong with that as i stated at the outset traditional korean music was pentatonic the singing style stressed melismatic and raspy vocalization and the performer stood still the stress was on the sound K-pop is uniformly diatonic, lyrics peppered with English phrases, the singing style is resolutely syllabic of Western pop, and dance is an integral element of the performance. Chosun period Pansori singers would recognise Cho young pils singing. It is highly unlikely that they could make any sense of girls' generation as fellow musicians. In terms of music, there is very little, if anything, of traditional Korean music. The radical displacement of traditional values is much clearer in the very popularity of K-pop. In the Korean Confucian worldview, the good life was the gentlemanly life, of which singing would be merely one element in a world that stressed learning. In any case, entertainment and celebrity entertainers were devoid of prestige, and not something that would be desirable. There were the, the four occupations. You find it under Wikipedia on that, I think. If you're not Korean, if you are, you'll know it already. Uh, the four occupations, and to be the learner was the top, the sa, and then the nong gong sang. But the sa was the top, and to be a singer or a dancer in the past was not prestigious uh, during the Joseon dynasty. Of course, that's changed. Yet, as I suggested, the most popular career choice for young South Koreans, the South Korean dream, is to be, to use the unfortunate mixed metaphor, a star in the Korean wave. All the strivings to be a popular culture star may be an expression of the new enriched and meritocratic South Korea, but it is surely opposed to the Confucian worldview. The very embodiment of K-pop is distinct from the traditional Korean body and beauty. What is striking about most K-pop acts is how tall, thin and unblemished they appear. This is, of course, a country that has sprouted up rapidly. The average 18-year-old male was 165 centimetres, 1977, but shot up to 174 by 2007. Furthermore, the standard of beauty had traditionally valorised round, even chubby look. The most popular member of the late 1980s idol group Sobanta was the chubby one in the middle. Yet all this changed beyond recognition. Beauty itself is stylized as aesthetic surgery is very much norm. The Confucian body that was envisioned as the precious gift from the parents, so much so that some Confucian literati refused to cut hair or clip fingernails, finds itself under scalpel in the name of beauty and popularity. K-pop is symptomatic of the cultural transformation of South Korea. At once the most complete repudiation of traditional cultures, both Confucian and folk, and the repeated rhetorical stress on the continuities between the past and the present. The nearly empty signifier that is South Korean cultural national identity. 
in conclusion, that's the physical aspects of it there if you want to go into those. Again, for time, I'll move on. The transformation of South Korea, or more broadly speaking, post-traditional Korea that we can date to the beginning of Japanese colonial rule, is rapid and compressed. Colonial rule, the Korean War, rapid industrialization and urbanization, and recent democratization, egalitarianism, have pulverized tradition for better and worse. In this context, the very idea of Korea and components of Korean culture were almost always in flux with radically distinct and con contradictory notions at play at any given point in time. Not surprisingly, Korean culture remains something of the proverbial floating and empty signifier of contemporary cultural studies. If one can understand the rise of K-pop largely as another instance of South Korean export success, triumph of the culture industry, then one should recognize that the sources of success denude and destroy whatever exists of received South Korean culture and tradition. Indeed, it is precisely because there isn't very much Korean in K-pop can it become such an easy sell to consumers abroad. In this sense, the K in K-pop is merely a brand, part of brand Korea, that has been the export-oriented South Korean government since the 1960s. The Korean wave in general, and K-pop in particular, is naked commercialism, albeit with the grateful garb of cultural respectability that comes from prestigious luxury goods. It would be too much, however, to regard this as having anything to do with traditional Confucian Korean culture. We get these ideas here of... There isn't very much Korean in K-pop. So when it's Korean pop, he's saying the K, John Lee is saying the K isn't about the Korean. It's a brand. It's gone beyond what is Korean. Because what he believes to be Korean, what is Korean-ness, for him is the Confucian ideas, the tradition, uh, and the folk and the pansori, all of these things are, are Korean. But in K-pop, there are none of these. So it's not Korean. The K is just a brand. It's a symbol. It's a logo. I'm saying this is a good or bad thing. This is John Lee's argument. But it doesn't mean Korean. That's an interesting point. And as this continues to be successful, this would be the conclusion that you want to make sure of. Um, to think about, not just to accept, but to think and see what you feel about it. As K-pop continues to be successful and people, by people I mean Koreans, I guess I mean Uri, continue to identify with it, continue to identify and celebrate it it destroy is a hard word but I'll, I'll use it anyway it destroys Korean culture how do you feel about that idea because what is promoted in Korean, in K-pop, is not actually Korean. And when K-pop is successful and that becomes the image of Korea and people start liking that both in Korea and outside Korea, then what was there traditionally just becomes, it becomes uh, something that gets lost. Now these things are just in the, the Hanok folk village and you wear a hanbok and take some pictures, but it's not part of culture of everyday life. It's being left behind. There's a lot in there. Uh, I'll, I'll finish this lecture now, but that's the paper by John Lee. It gives you a lot, and I don't expect you to really try to cover all of it, but I hope that you understood some of it. It's not that difficult. I tried to explain some parts. Now, for when you do your assignment, I'll just uh, make some notes so it's clear so you can see. Is there an empty white page I can use? Maybe at the top. Sorry while I do this, it takes a minute.
there's a bit of space here isn't there okay for your here's my pen okay when you do your assignment try to focus on this try to get a direct quote so uh, K-pop has been defined as you put the quote maybe you put number two and then at the bottom it says two John Lee page three four two is it you're actually getting direct quotes from something in here that you've read or you've understood or from the video use that as the basis for your work you, you don't need to do the whole thing but don't just go from your memory don't just go from what you've understood go back to the the text i've underlined lines i've showed you some or what i've said it can be from here or from me but take some stuff and and put it there and, and work around that start with some definitions or start with some ideas don't just go off memory because if you go off memory you might not be understanding it correctly you might not be remembering or expressing it correctly as a student as an academic you have to be able to use texts and you have to be able to take uh, ideas from them and then talk about them now later on in this course we'll be doing that with music videos but before we do that you need to show me you can do it with text so I don't mean you have to write this 20 page academic essay. That's not the point. You still do your normal work, but in that normal work, just try to show me that you're able to do a direct quote from either uh, the text, which is this or this video. Right? See if you can bring in one or two quotes and then keep talking about them. But that's what you need to start referencing. If you don't know how to do that, do some exploration and find out or you can ask me and I will give you some uh, private help if you get in touch. I hope you found this interesting. I hope you're learning something about the Korean wave and K-pop and it's, it's making you think and it's not just what you expected it to be. Keep challenging yourself. There will be a lot of difficult things in there. For now, I'll finish. Get in touch if you have any questions. If you feel like discussing things or if you're stuck, you can always use the e-class as well to ask your classmates because we really need to discuss these things. So I'll try to create some situations for that in future. For now, though, however, um, I'll stop recording. So thank you. Best of luck and I, I hope to see you soon. Goodbye.